Eighteen, a crag-like face. It was extraordinary to hear the third voice. The hour's ritual had only demanded a duologue against the horrible noise of the torture. Bond's dimmed senses hardly took it in. Then suddenly he was halfway back to consciousness. He found he could see and hear again. He could hear the dead silence after the one quiet word from the doorway. He could see the chief's head slowly come up and the expression of blank astonishment, of innocent amazement, slowly give way to fear. Stop, had said the voice, quietly. Bond heard slow steps approaching behind his chair. Drop it, said the voice. Bond saw the chief's hand open obediently and the knife fall with a clatter to the floor. He tried desperately to read into the chief's face what was happening behind him, but all he saw was blind incomprehension and terror. The chief's mouth worked, but only a high-pitched eek came from it. His heavy cheeks trembled as he tried to collect enough saliva in his mouth to say something, ask something. His hands fluttered vaguely in his lap. One of them made a slight movement towards his pocket, but instantly fell back. His round, staring eyes had lowered for a split second, and Bond guessed there was a gun trained on him. There was a moment's silence. A smirch. The word came almost with a sigh. It came with a downward cadence, as if nothing else had to be said. It was the final explanation. The last word of all. No, said Le Chief. No, I... His voice tailed off. Perhaps he was going to explain, to apologize... But what he must have seen in the other's face made it all useless. You're two men, both dead. You are a fool and a thief and a traitor. I have been sent from the Soviet Union to eliminate you. You are fortunate that I have only time to shoot you. If it was possible, I was instructed that you should die most painfully. We cannot see the end of the trouble you have caused. The thick voice stopped. There was silence in the room, save for the rasping breath of the sheaf. Somewhere outside, a bird began to sing, and there were other small noises from the awakening countryside. The bands of sunlight were stronger, and the sweat on the sheaf's face glistened brightly. Do you plead guilty? Bond wrestled with his consciousness. He screwed up his eyes and tried to shake his head to clear it, but his whole nervous system was numbed and no message was transmitted to his muscles. He could just keep his focus on the great pale face in front of him and on its bulging eyes. A thin string of saliva crept from the open mouth and hung down from the chin. Yes, said the mouth. There was a sharp, but no louder than a bubble of air escaping from a tube of toothpaste. No other noise at all, and suddenly the sheaf had grown in another eye. A third eye on a level with the other two, right where the thick nose started to jut out below the forehead. It was a small black eye without eyelashes or eyebrows. For a second, the three eyes looked out across the room, and then the whole face seemed to slip and go down on one knee. The two outer eyes turned trembling up towards the ceiling, then the heavy head fell sideways in the right shoulder and finally the whole upper part of the body lurched over the arm of the chair as if the sheaf was going to be sick. But there was only a short rattle of his heels on the ground and then no other movement. The tall back of the chair looked impassively out across the dead body in its arms. There was a faint movement behind Bond. A hand came from behind and grasped his chin and pulled it back. For a moment, Bond looked up into two glittering eyes behind a narrow black mask, and there was the impression of a crag-like face under a hat brim, the collar of a fawn Mackintosh. He could take in nothing more before his head was pushed down again. You are fortunate, said the voice. I have no orders to kill you. Your life has been saved twice in one day. But you can tell your organization that Smirsh is only merciful by chance or by mistake. In your case, you were first saved by chance, and now by mistake. For I should have had orders to kill any foreign spies who were hanging round this traitor like fries around a dog's mess. But I shall leave you my visiting card. You are a gambler. You play at cards. One day, perhaps, you will play against one of us. It would be well that you should be known as a spy. Steps moved round to behind Bond's right shoulder. There was the click of a knife opening. An arm in some grey material came into Bond's line of vision. A broad, hairy hand emerging from a dirty white shirt cuff was holding a thin stiletto like a fountain pen. It poised for a moment above the back of Bond's right hand, immovably bound with flex to the arm of the chair. The point of the stiletto executed three quick straight slashes. A fourth slash crossed them where they ended, just short of the knuckles. Blood in the shape of an inverted M welled out and slowly started to drip on the floor. The pain was nothing to what Bond was already suffering, but it was enough to plunge him again into unconsciousness. The steps moved quietly away across the room. The door was softly closed. In the silence, the cheerful small sounds of the summer's day crept through the closed window. High on the left-hand wall hung two small patches of pink light. They were reflections cast upward from the floor by the zebra stripes of June sunshine, cast upward from two separate pools of blood a few feet apart. As the day progressed, the pink patches marched slowly across the wall, and slowly they grew larger.